Hola, hola. Hello. Thanks everyone for joining us today. Hola and welcome. I am Ana Flores. I am the co-founder and CEO of We All Grow Latina. We All Grow Latina was founded in 2010 based on a simple yet revolutionary idea to build a community of authentic voices and connections for Latinas to increase visibility and grow our social and economic power. We stand strong in our mission of elevating the voices and stories of Latinas via the power of community through culturally relevant content, virtual and in-person spaces and events to bring together a sisterhood and a brotherhood of the most influential Latina, Latino creatives, entrepreneurs, and professionals. And in that spirit, today, we are incredibly proud to host La Historia Uncovered, created by Julissa Arce, a best-selling author of My Underground American Dream and Someone Like Me. La Historia Uncovered is a series of thought-provoking conversations led by best-selling author Julissa Arce with guest authors and journalists that will inspire us and strengthen our knowledge of the deep roots and history our community here in the U.S. Today is the first of four conversations of this weekly interview series. This is a true community effort in partnership with Latino Rebels, BZ, and She Se Puede, so that together we can uncover the lesser known history of the Latinx community in America during Latinx Heritage Month, which starts today. So, Julisa, bienvenida. Thank you so much. I am um, super excited and thank you so much everyone for uh, for joining us. I just really, Anna, I just want to give you the biggest hug when this pandemic is over because I couldn't have launched uh, La Historia Uncovered without you. And of course, also thank you to all of our uh, all of our partners, Latino Rebels, She Se Puede, Vice, and Thank you, thank you, thank you to each of you that is tuning in and that has a desire to learn together because that's what La Historia Uncovered is about. It's about us learning um, together. Uh, just one quick note before we get started about the series. So the series is a four part series. And while um, I tried and we tried to have a range of conversations and a range of topics about lesser known Latino uh, history, it is impossible that in four episodes, we would cover every part of Latino history. And I think that just goes to show the deep, uh, long cultural and historical ties that we have to this country. And so I hope that all of you would love, will, will love this series so much that we'll have to do a second season where we can add more voices and add more conversations. Um, if you are gonna tweet about it or post about it, which I hope that you do, please use the hashtag La Historia Uncovered. Uh, and my Instagram handle and Twitter are both at Julissa Arce. So over the past few months, I have been doing um, a lot of reading of Latinx history books as I have been doing research for my next book, Rejecting Assimilation. My book doesn't come out until next year, but as I was reading books like An African American and Latinx History of the United States, which is which was written by our guest, Dr. Paul Ortiz, I got really sad then I got really angry, and then I was incredibly inspired. Um, I was sad because it made me realize all the history that was robbed from us, all, all of the pain that um, our ancestors went, went through, the majesty of our heroes and the nuances of our history. And then I got angry because everything our people have endured without us even knowing. Um, and then mostly, though, I was really, really inspired because those stories that we don't know break down any walls that exist between us and this land. So uh, I'm going to make a very quick introduction of Dr. Paul Ortiz. He is a professor of history and the director of the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. And he is the author of Emancipation Betrayed, an African-American and Latinx history of the United States and co-editor of the oral history, Remembering Jim Crow. Paul, welcome to the program. Lisa, thank you so much for having me. It's such an honor to, to be here uh, with you this evening. Um, uh, it's so exciting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I just want to get, I want to get right into it because we have so much to cover. I mean, we're only really, 
we're, I mean, the, I'm focusing the conversation really on the early chapters of, uh, of, of your book because it, because it's so much and they're so rich. And so I just want to get right, right to it. But first I just want to say thank you for joining us. And most importantly, thank you for writing such an incredible book that has really helped me to reimagine our country and what's possible uh, once we know the history that was never taught to us. So um, to get right in, right into it, one of my favorite lines from the book is when you say that stories are the opposite of walls. They demand release and each image chips away at boundaries. So why did you feel that this story of African-Americans and Latinx people in the United States needed to be told and told in a way where you weave in the stories of Latinx people and African-Americans while at the same time telling each individual story with so much care and so much nuance. But why why was this story important for you to tell? Well, Ulisa, it's, it's a personal story. Um, it's also a story about my ancestors, you know, my comrades and the struggle. You know, I first really learned how to be a movement historian working with the United Farm Workers of Washington State mm -hmm. uh, in the Chateau Saint Michel boycott struggle in the late 80s and early 90s. You know, and, and it's also a story really dedicated to, you know, if I think back in my own life history as a student, and I work today with so many first generation college students. Um, I just did a, a workshop with a group of wonderful high school students in Florida. And they tell me the same thing. You know, we don't know any stories about our people. You know, we come from Cuba. We come from Haiti. We come from Mexico. We come from Eastern Europe. And, and no one tells us any stories about our ancestors. And they talk about the need for us to assimilate, right? That's right. the topic of your forthcoming book, which I'm so excited. And I really want to I want to take this opportunity to invite you to the University of Florida to come and talk about the book when it comes Thank out. you. Because it's so important, Hulicia, because we have been told for generations that we have to bend and break and assimilate into a dominant society, mm -hmm. which um, is an imperialistic society. It's a racist society. It, and the reason that many of us are here, in fact, is because of American imperialism, right? Juan right. Gonzalez has the wonderful metaphor, harvest of empire. And what mm -hmm. Gonzalez is trying to get us to understand, it's kind of like when uh, Juno Diaz says, the reason I'm here, uh, uh, because my ancestors were from the Dominican Republic, but the reason I'm here, Diaz t tells us, is that the U.S. invaded my country in right. 1965 and drove my people out. And so we ended up growing up in New York and, and New Jersey. So it's really all those reasons. And when I grew up, uh, we didn't hear anything about the contributions of Mexican Americans, Chicanos, uh, Latinos, African Americans, and I think I kind of combined, tried to think about those stories in concert with each other. You know, the the amazing story of the African diaspora and the freedom struggle, with the freedom struggles of our peoples, because they're mm -hmm. so intertwined. And one anecdote I can share with you, uh, one experience as a teacher, time after time. I will have students come into my office hours and I can almost, um, I can actually predict this now, Julissa, the, the lecture I give on the Mexican War of Independence, mm. which we are just now celebrating, right? The, you know, for, for Latinx Heritage Month. When I tell the story about how our war for independence started as a struggle against slavery, as a struggle against the oppression of indigenous peoples, in addition to being an independent struggle, and I tell them that, and I tell them that African Americans found sanctuary in Mexico even before Mexico won its independence from Spain. I'll have students, first gen students from Mexico, and they will tell me, they'll say, you know, uh, and they'll come into my office. Sometimes they're in tears, hmm. they're crying. They're saying, we never heard these stories. Yeah. You know, we now have a reason to be proud of where we came from. Hmm. And, you know, they shouldn't have to wait that long. Yeah. It, we should grow up with these stories. And I, I think sometimes we're almost embarrassed because we're trying so hard to somehow assimilate to a dominant um, kind of culture, a dominant narrative. Um, you know, it's kind of like when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. said shortly before he passed away, why would I want to integrate onto a burning ship? Yeah. Really? You know? Yeah. 
That's incredible. Yeah. Um, well, one of one of the one of the things that um, that that you know your book really made me realize is that um, one of the biggest reasons for me of sort of assimilating in my earlier years as an immigrant to the country is because I felt like I didn't have a history here, right? And um, and I think that as long as we continue to teach the same history, the same incomplete history. As long as we continue to teach that incomplete history, we are allowing white supremacy to continue because we learn all through school, we learn all the stories of the white heroes of the United States. We learn the stories of uh, the civilization of Europe, but we don't learn the things that you're teaching in your book, which uh, which I want to take a step back and just look at, you were you were briefly mentioning about the freedom struggles in Mexico and Haiti and Cuba and Latin America, and how those struggles were so different. And there was a very clear difference between the independence uh, struggles in Latin America and the independence struggle of the United States. And I'm wondering if you could share some of the things that you share in your book about how those two uh, freedom struggles were different. The freedom struggles, you know, there's similarities and then there's there's radical differences, uh, right? And one of the radical differences is that if you talk about Cuba, you talk about Haiti, you talk about Mexico in the early 19th century, those freedom struggles are independent struggles, kind of like the American Revolution was an independent struggle, right? But the difference is they're profoundly anti-imperial struggles or profoundly anti-racist struggles. And so what I mean by this is if you look at the Mexican War of Independence, if you look at it carefully and you look at how armies were recruited to fight the Spanish, and the thing we have to understand, really say, if you go back to the early 19th century, my gosh, to take on the Spanish Empire was an astonishing heroic thing. It's the mightiest empire still in the world. I mean, the British are going to eclipse the, the, the Spanish, but the Spanish are still on top. If you came to me and I was a peasant, I was an enslaved person, you know, I, I was a mestizo or whatever, and you say, hey, take up arms against, against the Spanish empire in 1810. Are you kidding me? What hope of success do you possibly have? But those wars were animated by this great idea, the idea of, of human equality, of human liberty. Uh, and not abstract. It was not an abstraction. And in writing African American and Latinx history in the United States, I went back and I looked at the papers and the correspondence of people mm -hmm. like John Adams, like Alexander Hamilton, like Jefferson, because I wanted to make sure that my suspicions were true. And in fact, they were. Jefferson, Adams, and Hamilton never planned a revolution which was going to give you or me equality with right. them. That was never their plan. Their plan was us was for us to be second class or third class citizens or enslaved people, right? But that, if you look at this, the Haitian liberation struggle, the Cuban struggle, Jose Marti, Antonio Maceo, I just talked to a group of, of, of high school students in Florida about those, those uh, freedom fighters. From the very beginning, the idea was the equality of all people and also challenging economic exploitation and also challenging imperialism, those three great um, goals. And that's what differentiates the Latin American independence struggles, who they said. Let me give you one more example. When, when, when U.S. Americans talk about the deficits in, in, in our Constitution, when we talk about things like the Electoral College, we talk about endless wars, um, and they say, what, how, how are we going to solve this problem? And I've been all over the country to give lectures. And people get up in the first Q&A, you know, how do we solve the problems, Professor Ortiz, that we have? with our constitution. And you know what I tell them? I say, why don't you look to our neighbor, Mexico? Look mm -hmm. at the Mexican constitution and look at that proud history of non-intervention. Mm -hmm. And I ask my audiences, I say, I just want to give you a pop quiz. I'm a historian, right? So I, I've got it, I'm a professor. So, I got <laughs> and so uh, my pop quiz for you is how many nations has Mexico carpet bombed? Mm -hmm. Nations as Mexico invaded. And no, I'm not claiming that Mexico is perfect. It has right. flaws in either nation, right? But there's this proud and important and intellectual history of non-intervention, 
which is rooted in the Mexican War of Independence fighting an imperial nation. Unfortunately, the U.S., in contrast, we also were fighting an imperial nation, right, in 1776, right. trying to break free from a terrible, vicious, oppressive colonialism. But unfortunately, because of white supremacy, and you mentioned this in your preface, because of settler colonialism, we turned around and mimicked, mimicked right. the worst behaviors of the British Empire. We mimicked the worst behaviors of the French Empire. Uh, we strengthened slavery instead of breaking it. And right. that, that's what people in Mexico and the Cuban liberation struggles and most of the Latin American independent struggles were able to do. So in the sense of advancing human rights, uh, those struggles were far superior. And that superiority, by the way, it, uh, continues well into the 20th century. But again, we're not taught those shining moments of, of emancipation. And if we're a society which says we're, we're, that we're down with freedom and justice, wow, we have a lot to learn. Right. Yeah, and I and I loved something that something else that you said, which was that um, you know we want to if we really want to uh, look for uh, more perfect democracies, not that any of them are perfect, but a better example that we need to look to Latin America as much as we look to Europe for those types of government and uh, and for examples of what uh, true liberation or or at least a struggle for true liberation was. One of the things that you said um, in your book was that the uh, the American struggle for independence was uh, was mostly fought by proprietor. How do, I can't say that word, but people who own property, <laughs> um, by by people who own property uh, to safeguard slavery, property, and political power, uh, and in many ways, I think I think that the American independence um, was as much about freedom as as it was about preserving a system of slavery, and um, and it, you know it all goes back to what you were saying, which was about um, was about white supremacy and upholding white supremacy and upholding everything that white supremacy um, is 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 has it is hands on. Um, but I was listening. You mentioned Hamilton in the previous in the previous answer, and I was listening to a podcast interview that you that you did previously. And you talk about Hamilton, the musical, and and you said something that I mean I had to like rewind and and listen to it again because I was like he said what, uh, <laughs> uh, but after you said it I understood it and and you said that Hamilton um, Hamilton the musical which is you know which is I think a musical that a lot of people have embraced and love both because Lin Manuel Miranda uh, wrote it and and is and is behind it and also because. The majority of the cast are, are are black people and people of color, so we're we're seeing different type of representation. But ultimately, Hamilton Hamilton the musical is a story about Hamilton, and you said that um, that Hamilton is a white nationalist production. So, what do you mean by that? <laughs> well, now you're going to get me into trouble, right? <laughs> uh, I mean, first of all, I love Lin Man Manuel Miranda. I mean, one of the great artists of our time. I saw him actually being interviewed the other day, and he broke into like um, a rhyme. I was like, "Wow, you go, guy!" I mean, it was yeah, incredible. you know. So, and, and I've listened to the music, and you know, look. I mean, my wife and I are actually planning to watch the movie this weekend. You know, right. Hamilton, and I tell people watch it. And I believe in the importance of representation, Lisa, in terms yeah. of, you know, how um, black and brown people have been excluded from, from Broadway for generations. From every aspect of American it, society. Exactly. And so, you know, we have to give major props there. The problem is that, and, and you know, Lin-Manuel Miranda has actually recently admitted this, that he got the story wrong that Hamilton is not a character that we should have seen on stage being portrayed as kind of a proto-abolitionist. That's just mm -hmm. not true. And I think Ishmael Reed has done this in a real gentle manner. Ishmael Reed is one of the great novelists of our time. And he wrote a wonderful play, which actually premiered at the New Yorican Poets uh, uh, Cafe uh, in New York mm -hmm. recently. That's an iconic place. Yeah, it's called The Haunting of Lin-Manuel Miranda. And it's a very gentle kind of story where it's patterned after Charles Dickens's Christmas Carol. And Miranda is kind of haunted by these different characters that are not in Hamilton. Uh, an enslaved African-American woman who actually was a slave of the Schuyler sisters who were portrayed in, in, the, in the documentary. 
um, a Native American uh, who Hamilton frequently uh, depicted Native Americans as savages, as mm. people who need to be wiped out, right? Um, a poor white person. Uh, and, and all the people who are not depicted in Hamilton. And what Ishmael says is, you know, look, uh, Miranda was, was kind of fooled by a group of, of, unfortunately, academic historians to try to create a Hamilton who did not exist in reality. Hmm. Uh, and, you know, as the play, and I've read part of the script and the play ends and or the musical ends and there's this allusion to, well, if Hamilton could have lived longer he might have become an abolitionist, right? Mm. Well, the problem with that is that, um, I mean, if you wanted to write a musical about a real abolitionist during that time, you know, write about, you know, Jose Maria Mor Morelos of Mexico, who actually was an abolitionist. Mm. Write about Thomas Paine, he was a real abolitionist. And I think that um, I call it, I, I stand by that depiction. You made me flinch a little bit when you said, why not? <laughs> I mean, here's the thing, Lisa, I mean, I, again, I'll go back to my own experiences. When I was a kid in, in first and second grade, they used to dress up the little kids of color yeah. in, in, in white wigs. And they used to have us pretend that we were George Washington, Alexander Hamilton, John Adams. And I don't remember. I mean, it was stressful for me because I can never remember my lines. I mean, <laughs> But, you know, I got to wonder how long are we going to continue doing that kind of thing? You know, why don't we have a musical that portrays people like, um, you know, <laughs> like Antonio Maceo, the bronze titan of, of, of Cuba, uh, or Dolores Huerta, who's 90 years young, you know, who's one right. of the characters of all American history. Why do we have to kind of have a fantasy about Alexander Hamilton, who really hated us? Um, mm -hmm. If you look at his correspondence, um, he had no love for us, and none yeah. of the fathers did that. That's the thing that I'm trying to get people to understand. Insofar as you and I enjoy the rights that we have now, uh, the wonderful books you've written, um, what I've been able to do as a teacher, the founding fathers didn't have those faiths in store for us. They saw you and I as workforces. Hmm. Never saw us as, as being able to, to participate equally as citizens. It's our ancestors who made those, those uh, rights and responsibilities possible, you know, beginning in Latin America, beginning in the Caribbean, beginning in Africa. And that's why I kind of, you know, chapter one of the book is the Haitian Revolution, because I want to decenter this white supremacist yeah. narrative of American history. Look, all of our peoples in Mexico, we have testimony. If anyone doubts this, Simon Bolivar, the great liberator of Central America, Venezuela, Jose Morelos, Vicente Guerrero, the list goes on and on. They all give major props, not to the founding fathers, but to the Haitians. Mm -hmm. The Haitian Revolution, which breaks the back of slavery and imperialism in the Americas, it's the first independent uh, uh, free republic that's created in the entire yeah. Isn't that crazy that people like people don't know that? People don't realize that it was it was liberation started in Haiti. Yeah. And, and that was the beacon of hope for so many people. It was Haiti that was the beacon of hope for freedom for so many people, not um, not the United States, and, and particularly not at that time when slavery was, you know, the reason, uh, one of the reasons that the United States even exists. Exactly. You know, the settler colonialism. And, and I want people, you know, people often ask me um, what books I suggest them to, to read. And I say, read the most important history book I've read in my entire adult lifetime, Ulisa, is Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz's book, An Indigenous People's History of the United States. Mm. I highly suggest that book because it tells us where the U.S. went wrong. You connect, you know, the oppression of indigenous peoples, settler colonialism to slavery. Those three things you cannot um, untangle from each other. Yeah. It's us steamrolls into Mexico, it invades Mexico. And by the way, when I was a kid growing up, they called it the, the what do they call it? The Mexican-American the Mexican -American American War. War. My gosh, and, and some kids still use that term. Yeah. And you know, I talked to a group of teachers the other day about it. I, they asked me to do um, a high school history workshop. And the one thing I want to, to let you know, which I think you'll be happy about is my gosh, school districts across this country now are getting the news. They're yeah. students teachers, parents are demanding a new kind of history. But I looked at one of their lesson plans 
Americans. And they had this phrase, <laughs> the, the, the Mexican-American War. I said, stop, y'all, stop. It, it wasn't the Mexican-American, it was the U.S. invasion of Mexico mm -hmm. to grow slavery. Yep. That's what John Quincy Adams called it. That's what Abraham Lincoln called it. That's what the people in power at the time were very honest about. Uh, and it's just that in, in, in recent years, historians, uh, and again, that's why, again, I don't blame Lin-Manuel Miranda for his interpretation of Hamilton, because again, he leaned on people like us in the academy, academic historians. Right. We have been predominantly a white nationalist profession. Hmm. And we're only now really trying to break free of those bonds. I mean, I have to pinch myself all the time because I go into a classroom and I start and, and, and I, uh, the, the, the propaganda, Lisa, is so intense. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I remember walking into a Florida classroom back in 2008. And this is, this is an embarrassing story. I walk in, I have a U.S. history textbook. And the theme that week was isolationism. And I started talking about, well, you know, the U.S. was an isolationist nation until, and then a student raised her hand. She was a Haitian American student. And she said, excuse me, professor, um, I, I'm Haitian. And the U.S. has uh, 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 instituted a blockade of Haiti the moment we gained our independence in 1804, you know? Huh. And another student, yeah. a Cuban American student said, well, you know, we were gonna get our independence and the U.S. invaded us. Hmm. So what, what's this whole thing about isolationism? We don't understand it. Can you, can you break that down for us? And, and I had to check myself. I'm like, wow, I've swallowed the white nationalist Kool-Aid because as woke as I thought I was in 08, <laughs> I was still teaching that kind of old colonial, you know, master mm. mindset. Um, yeah, it's, so it's funny because I, um, you know, it, I'm so glad we're having this conversation because there are different points in my in my next book, Rejecting Assimilation, where I do refer to uh, the intervention of the United States as the Mexican-American War. So I'm so glad you said that because it's still something I can change uh, and make sure I don't call it that. Uh, in Mexico, because I grew up in Mexico and so I studied, you know, I had some history lessons in Mexico and we called it La Intervención Estadounidense. Right, which is which translates into the intervention of the United States because that's that's what it was, um, and yeah, you know the thing about Hamilton, um, what had really stood out to me in that podcast was uh, was sort of the way that you framed it as um, it's one story, but the problem is not so much the telling of that story, but the fact that that's those are the only stories we continue continue to tell, and therefore like we never learn about the heroes that exist in our community that, that, our, that our ancestors were. Um, I have a couple more questions for you um, and I'll make them brief because I do wanna open it up to, to questions from the audience. So if you do have a question, um, I would just wait until I cue you to ask your question because uh, there's so many comments that um, they're kind of getting lost. But so if you have a specific question, just hang on one second and then ask it because I, we do wanna take questions from the audience. Um, so one of the other things that that you kind of alluded to right now, which is the kind of how the U.S. intervened in so many different places. And I think that that's one aspect of U.S. history that's often hidden, um, not just how imperfect our union really is and the principles on which it was founded are also imperfect, but how the U.S. also actively stopped freedom in Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, you, you write that the progress of anti-slavery insurgencies in Haiti and Mexico and other parts of Latin America filled U.S. political leaders with dread. So can you give us, a, you, you kind of gave us the example of, of, of Cuba and you mentioned um, the Dominican Republic, which, you know, I think so many of us don't even understand the, the scope of intervention like i had no idea that the us at one point had invaded haiti the philippines like so many places uh and so can you give us a couple of of examples um of of when the us intervened to kind of stop freedom in other places uh in latin american places and also how did us leaders viewing us as racially inferior shape their strategy in, in Latin America. I mean, when I read some of those correspondences that you're talking about, that you wrote about, um, I mean, it, it, it like it made my skin crawl when when we were referred to as, you know, savages, when when the founding fathers would say that we were not racially capable of having our own governments and governing ourselves. Uh, so can you can you tell us more about that? 
Yeah, so, so I'll, I'll start from the, the, the first part of your question. So let's just take one year, 1915. So that year, the U.S. invaded or occupied Haiti and soon after did the same thing to, to the neighboring Dominican Republic. And they did that uh, ostensibly to protect American property, but the real reason was to help U.S. banks cement their control over Caribbean finance. And what I mean by this, this is an early example of what economic scholars now call financialization. Hmm. What U.S. banks wanted to take control of was the respective debts of each society. Because as we know now, in the wake of the 2008 Great Depression, uh, Great Recession rather, debt is a powerful financial instrument, right? Yeah, and, and we'll be talking about the, the, the Puerto Rican debt uh, with Ed Morales next week. Exactly. Uh, but, but, yeah, continue. Yeah. I'm so glad that he's going to be, he's an amazing person. Um, so yeah, in 1915, the U.S. goes in and, and really um, at the behest of New York-based banks to take over the society, to take over Haiti's budget, they do this, we do the same thing with the Dominican Republic. And one of the things I learned in writing an African American and Latinx history of the United States is I learned pretty quickly, can't trust the New York Times to talk honestly about U.S. foreign policy, hmm. trust the Washington Post. And if you look at the history of those mainstream, uh, 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 I'll call them Anglo newspapers, because that's what they always have been, frankly, um, they have always been on the side of U.S. intervention. So hmm. why is that? You know, we, we, we should ask ourselves that question. But Julissa, on the other side, what I discovered was when I looked at black newspapers from 1915, they were telling the truth. Hmm. They brought it down. They said, why would the U.S. claim to be going to Haiti and, and Nicaragua, Honduras, to bring democracy to those countries? What a bad joke. The U.S. Hmm. doesn't care about democracy. <laughs> we can't even vote in our own country. And so you're talking about de democracy in Haiti or the hmm. Dominican Republic? And so that's what, that was a humbling lesson for me to learn, that I had been looking for history in all the wrong places. And I needed to look at black newspapers. And just like this earlier time period, you mentioned about what the founding fathers, how they can see people from Latin America. They saw us as little better than savages. They, they said, and, and because periodically there would be popular American support for people like Simon Bolivar, right? He was considered to be an international hero. But again, the so-called founding fathers and their sons basically said, don't admire Simon Bolivar or don't, don't support what's happening in Mexico, that, that's not like our independent struggle because those, those savages there, those Indians and mixed people, and that's how they referred us to, as, right. as, um, and they came up with a lot of derogatory terms with yeah. them here. Uh, they don't understand freedom. They don't have a sense of responsibility. Right. This is why I was so glad to, to learn about this incredible Mexican-American uh, California uh, Mexicano tradition of abolitionism. And I try to talk about this in the book, you know, these incredible, like we know about Frederick Douglass, we, everyone should know Frederick Douglass was, but what I try to do is introduce people to the, the great Mexican and Mexican American abolitionists in California who are writing in Spanish language newspapers, vicious denun denunciations of American colonialism, imperialism and slavery. And so you have these dueling freedom struggles, you know, if, if, if you will. And um, the, the last thing I'll say about this, Lisa, is that if you want to understand 19th century U.S. political history, here's the most important fact. All of the nations that we've been talking about so far, even the imperialist nations, even France, even Great Britain, the Dutch, all of them are moving towards abolition of slavery in the early 19th century. Mm -hmm. 1800s. Alone out of those, it's the U.S. and the Portuguese in Brazil who are moving in the opposite direction. We're moving towards empire. Hmm. We're moving towards expanding slavery. And if you look at Brazil today and the United States today, we're almost like uncomfortably mirrored images of each other in certain ways, right? You know, we have right-wing governments. Uh, we have governments which have been uh, complicit in the, the suppression uh, of civil liberties. We have governments which have smashed uh, black uh, neighborhoods. 
uh, immigrant neighborhoods. We have governments which have been nativist. And so again, that that's a, that's a really important thing to understand. I mean, think about think about the U.S. in in the 1840s. By the, by the 1840s, the British Empire's outlawed slavery. The French Empire's outlawed slavery. The Seminoles are fighting a desperate battle with their African American allies in Florida to keep slavery out of out, out of Florida. Right? And Mexico has abolished slavery decades earlier. Mm-hmm. And, Many African Americans are finding sanctuary and freedom in Mexico, um, and in the Bahamas, <laughs> and in even Martinique, right? And 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 it's the U.S. who's still trying, because the U.S., you know, to be honest, slavery was too profitable for yeah. to get shed of, and all these other nations said we're going to we're going to abolish it, but it was just too profitable for the U.S. And that really created a set of, of attitudes and behaviors towards property and towards the value of human life yeah. that I think we're grappling with now. And the reason why we have to have a Black Lives Matter movement at this late date to even just affirm the idea that Black, that lives, Black lives Matter. Can you imagine after Black people have been brought here in chains in the 1500s and for over 400 years later, you have to have a movement to affirm that Black Lives Matter? Uh, the, the society should be ashamed that that we're in that. And but I will say on the on, on the positive side, the Black Lives Matter movement has opened so many new spaces for us to talk about our histories. We listen, and, and, yeah. and the last thing I'll say is that I have more Latinx and Hispanic and and Chicanx, you know, uh, history events this month than ever in my entire career. Great. And I really credit it to the Black Lives Matter movement because it's opened our hearts and our minds to the histories of oppressed people. And it yeah. really made a difference. Yeah, and, and you know, um, I think that that's one of the things that really, I mean, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're here talking about uh, Latinx history, which, which of course is, is also black history because we can't forget that like there are, and, and, and we are going to talk about um, later in the series specifically about, uh, about uh, black Latinos and, and black Latino history. But one of the things that really stood out to me specifically about your book and sort of that, um, that the African-American struggle, it's also just how, uh, how much African-Americans supported freedom struggles everywhere else in the world even as they were fighting for their own uh for their own freedom uh here in the united states and how uh, they had this idea of international emancip- emancipatory internationalism um and you know we i want to get to the questions from the audience but um so we we won't have time to talk about that and plus everybody should should get the book um you can see how many notes i made because i just i learned so much from this book but the last question I want to ask you um, before we open it up to to Q and A is that you know we're currently in the midst of a reckoning I think within our community uh, facing issues of race, racism and anti blackness anti indigenous sentiments within within our own Latinx community and you know we're wrestling with our colonial history with the caste system that defined society in colonial times um, and I think part of eradicating that racism within our community is to understand the, the dynamics that created it. So I want to just take a quick step back um, because in reading your book, you know, you alluded to a lot of these figures, um, leaders like Vicente Guerrero, Jose Martí, and others who fought against slavery, who fought for the right of Black and Indigenous people. Um, you write that generations of people in the U.S. drew inspiration and lessons from the Haitian Revolution, the Mexican War of Independence, the Cuban War of Liberation. So where did we go wrong? Because uh, it often, I, I, I often feel, um, I'm often dumbfounded by how we Latinos are part of an oppressed group, and yet we are also some of the worst oppressors within our own community, and particularly towards Black people, particularly towards Indigenous people. So where do we go wrong? Because I feel like when I'm reading this stuff, it's like night and day of what our ancestors were fighting for and what they stood for, and some of the issues that are so prevalent in our community. Where do we go wrong? I mean, it's an important question. Well, one of the, I'd like to start with the concept of self-hatred. You know, it's it's a family question because, you know, again, I didn't grow up learning this history. I didn't learn to be proud of 
my ancestors. I kind of knew they had fought in the Mexican Revolution, but I didn't quite know what they had done. It was never presented in a book. It was never presented in a lesson plan. It wasn't talked about in our churches, our, our, our organizations, you know, not in the Boy Scouts. You know, even in the Boy Scouts, you learn about Alexander Hamilton yet again, right? <laughs> so that led to a level, you know, we used to call this, you know, and I'll borrow from my dear friend and colleague, Ibram Kendi. Uh, who wrote the wonderful How to Be an Anti-Racist. Ibram talks about- Who wrote, who wrote you a, a beautiful blurb. So he yeah. supports the book. You guys should buy the book. I'm just going to put it up here for a second because people were asking about the name of it. So. Thank you. Well, Ibram is too kind. But, you know, Ibram Kennedy tells us that even as a young black boy growing up, he imbibed this image of, of, of denigration about black people because it was so dominant in the society. And I think that's where I begin is we don't learn our own histories. We've forgotten our freedom struggles. Look, I had to learn most of the material, Alicia, in that book as an adult. I didn't know that growing up. I didn't know that when I was your age. And the other thing I want to report is that, um, well, first I want to talk about Spanish colonialism for, for just a minute. The Spanish imposed a horrific system of racism onto indigenous America. And when they grafted slavery onto that, they kind of hyped it. And so in the Spanish empire, to be non-white was to be a punishment and a denigration in and of itself. It meant you were subjected to draconian punishments. You were subjected to physical, to whipping, to beatings. It meant you couldn't become a skilled craftsperson. Hmm. You couldn't even become a carpenter if you were an indigenous person in the Spanish empire because of the Costa system. So after centuries, we overthrew the Spanish, we overthrew the Portuguese, we overthrew the Dutch, so on and so forth. And yet those habits of mental slavery still mm -hmm. stayed in our communities. And we brought them with us. We, we kind of we bring these kind of mixed legacies. So on the one hand, yeah. I would argue we bring social democracy to the United States. That's one of our great gifts. If you look at the leadership of the most progressive trade unions in this country, almost all of them led by young Latina Latinx women. Most of them first generation from Central America, from Mexico. From the future Caribbean. is Latina. Exactly. <laughs> and the other thing I want to mention is that oppression does not always generate solidarity, hmm. right? Because hmm. we live in a racial capitalist system, which has always been based on the notion of dividing the long term. The good news, is that in Florida, which you know we have a very distinctive, distinctive Hispanic communities, right? Yeah. Um, I have spent many hours just in the past year uh, going physically to, to Miami-Dade when I could, or Hialeah, or Fort Lauderdale, uh, now via Zoom, working with amazing groups, uh, you know, local Latinx community organizers who have held anti-black, uh, 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 how to defeat anti-black racism in our communities and how anti-black racism cripples us. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it eliminates our ability to grapple successfully with white right. supremacy because we have to remember that our struggles are really bound up with economic justice struggles. Right. We're a working class people. We, we always will be. I mean, um, I've been blessed to, to become a, a history professor but the reality is that most black and brown people for the rest of our lives will be working class people. And capitalism is a system which is inherently oppressive right. and it's created these pressures on us and, and it's created these kind of divide and conquer pressures. But I would argue that's not really who we are. And if we remember our histories, we remember, um, and you don't have to be a radical to understand the importance of mutual aid societies in Mexico in the 18th century, the 19th century. You don't have to be radical to understand the system, the beautiful system of village democracy, which bore, brought into being people like Emiliano Zapata. He was an elected leader of his village even before the Mexican revolution of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. The system of leadership that elected him to a position of leadership, which catapulted him into world leadership, it was centuries old, it preceded right. European imperialism. And the Mexican Revolution, by the way, I want to say, I give a shout out to my dear uh, friend and colleague, Christina Heatherton, uh, who is on the cusp of 
writing, a, a, actually publishing a book, which is going to demonstrate once and for all that the Mexican revolution of the 20th century was the most important revolution of the 20th century. Hmm. And in fact, for oppressed people, even superseded the Russian revolution. Hmm. Uh, because, you know, and it was a bloody revolution. Yes, I mean, it was the revolution that my family you know, fled from it cost more than a, 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 a you know million and a half lives, right? Hmm. But it gave us so many things. It gave us a constitution based on non-intervention, right? Anti-imperialism. It, it gave us a constitution which articulated the equality of women. It gave us a constitution which articulated land reform. It gave us a constitution which articulated the dignity of working uh, of, of labor. And from the minute it was framed, the U.S. and again the European powers intervened to try to stunt it the way that they did to Haiti in, in the wake of the Haitian Revolution. Because for some reason, our, our leaders in New York and DC and, and places can't let us alone, right? Hmm. Just can't let us alone. I mean, the, the last thing I'll mention is, you know, we talk about Haiti and a lot of people talk about the Haitian Revolution, right? And we understand now, hopefully, its importance. But would you be surprised if I told you that the concept of equality between nations connected to the concept of the equality within nations was actually invented by the Haitians. They're the ones that came up with the idea. And, and that's the reason that the U.S. has worked so hard to try to get us to believe that, you know, Haiti and Mexico are so backwards. Right. Um, you know, they were like these third world countries where nothing good comes from. But, you know, what that guy said. Um, which is totally untrue. Yeah, there was, I mean, there was so many, um, and we're, we're, get, we're getting close to, to our time. Um, so if you do have a question, please, uh, this is a time to put it in the comments so that I can pick a couple of questions and, um, and we can, we can keep pick, uh, picking uh, Dr. Ortiz's brain. I know for me, when I was reading this book, like there were so many light bulbs that went off. Um, and just while I wait for, for questions to come in, one of the big light bulbs that went off when I was reading the book was, how so many of these freedom fights and revolutions were also about owning property and like owning property as like almost like a human right, right? Like this is our land, we should own property. And I was just thinking how now, uh, how difficult it is to own property, uh, particularly in places like where I live in California and Los Angeles, like in my neighborhood houses are, you know, a million and a half, two million, three million dollar houses. And so, uh, and so I was thinking like, I was like, man, I never really, I used to think like, whatever, if I don't own a home, I don't own a home. But now I'm like, no, it is like my human right to own land. And so I'm like, I am going to buy a house now. Um, so thank you, because that's the light bulb that went off when I was reading. <laughs> one of the many, by the way, one of the many. So um let me, uh, here's the question. We answer a lot of them actually, because when we were talking, people were asking about uh, what you thought about uh, Black Lives Matter, which you, you've already, uh, you already talked about. Um, and I'm wondering if you could, um, if you could put the question, the, the link back in the comments to creating conversations link where people can buy uh, Dr. Ortiz's book because pe people were asking just where they could buy it and where the name of, um, what the name of the book was. I did see that question. So, um, what are uh, doctors? What are your thoughts on uh, on DACA and its current state under the Trump presidency? Um, and just, I think, more broadly, um, what are your kind of thoughts on the current sort of immigration crisis that we're that we're going through? We have to fight like like heck to defend our brothers and sisters who don't have full immigration rights. The way I see it is we have over 12 million people who are so-called undocumented citizens. Not all of them are from Latin America. Some mm -hmm. of them are from Africa, Eastern Europe, and other places. And I see that this is kind of the new Jim Crow, to borrow mm -hmm. by Michelle Alexander. Why does racial capitalism depend upon disenfranchising millions of workers every generation? You know, basta ya, we gotta stop this. You know, we got to defend DACA, and, and I have a lot of students who have been undocumented who are now, you know, younger labor leaders, you know, attorneys, you know, before it was the AB 540 system in California where I taught for many years. And we just have to defend what we have. Don't gain, don't lose, or don't cede one inch, right? Defend 
DACA, but at the same time, look at expanding it and look at full amnesty. Uh, I'm not going to be happy unless until we get there. Yeah. And I, you know, I think people are like scared of the word amnesty and I'm like, no, like, mm. I mean, I know that the right has like weaponized the word amnesty, but I'm like, that is what we need. Actually. Our labor built this nation. And if you look at the 1980s, Ulyssa, everyone, the, you look at the Chamber of Commerce, the National Restaurant Industry Association, the Grocers Associations were begging for workers. They put out the word in all of our nations in Latin America, we need workers. We don't have enough labor, right? And so we answered their call by the right. military. And many of us, as Juan Gonzalez uh, has taught, were chased out of our own countries. Central America, you know, look, I was a soldier in US Special Forces in the mid eighties. I was part of the problem, right? And we promoted civil wars in Central America. We drove people out of their own nations. And so, what, how in, on earth is it up to us to decide who is not and who is a citizen for a person who has worked here 20, 25, 30, 40 years? I mean, it's really sad. And I know this is going to be, I know this is controversial because even within my, my own family, you know, I have people who are like, hey, you know, well, you know, we worked hard in our generation, Paul, but this new generation of Mexican Americans are just so lazy. We have to guard, we have to fight that within our own families. Yeah. It's so easy, again, within that capitalist divide and conquer mentality, you know, you mentioned property, right? Okay, so I own a house. Um, I don't see anything wrong with that. It's security for my family, right? Um, but when is enough enough, right? We have this class, this growing class of billionaires and, you know, all these corporations making money out of our communities. And yeah. they're the ones who are trying to stop immigration reform. So let's build a movement I mean, let's get Trump out of office, yes. Uh, First and foremost, I hope everyone's registered to vote. But at the same time, let's not be ashamed to use the term amnesty. My gosh, Ronald Reagan used the term amnesty in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, if you believe in hard work, who are the hardest working people in the history of the society? Number one, enslaved African Americans, right, and their, and their descendants. And and we're, we're pretty much a close second, I would argue. I mean, mm -hmm. we're our keep and we've done and that's why i say in the book we should not be ashamed of who we are and i think that's yeah. the biggest problem because of the shame we have and we've been made to feel and we've kind of we've kind of uh incorporated uh we're shy about asserting ourselves yeah let's, let, let's stop with that yeah absolutely um thank you so thank you so much for that there's there's so many there's so many questions there's I just want to briefly say there. So there's a question about the the census and the fact that um, you know there's the, the racial categories are such that uh, so many Latinos feel like the only choice we have is to check white uh, on it when it comes to to a, to our racial like what race are we um, and uh, and I just want I just wanted to briefly say that we are going to be speaking with uh, Dr. Laura Gomez who wrote uh, Inventing Latinos and uh, Manifest Destinies, uh, The Making of the Mexican American Race. And so there we're gonna have a really, really deep discussion about precisely that question and um, how Latinos came to be a ethnicity instead of a race and what that means for us. So I just wanted to answer that question um, very briefly, which just to say, Tune in September uh, 30th because that's when we'll be speaking with uh, Doctor. Uh, I don't know if she's. I don't know. If, I mean, she. I have a random question. Are all PhDs doctors? Well, yeah, or professors. I mean, she's wonderful. I'm going to be tuning into that show. Who is awesome. She's, she's, yeah. Yeah, she's amazing. Um, she's really, really great. So, uh, okay. So I do. There is a question, sort of. Um, it's not a specific question because there's a lot of questions that are alluding to this, which is how do we begin to de decolonize our history and uh, what we teach children in school? And I know that you have exciting news about about your book. Um, so I'm wondering if you can share some of like what what we, what can we do to start um, decolonizing our textbooks? Now is the time. And again, the Black Lives Matter movement has opened this space. There were movements beforehand. Let me share with you what's happening in Connecticut. So the state of Connecticut has passed a law. All public school graduates will learn, will take courses in African-American history, Latinx history, and Puerto Rican history. 
hmm. not an elective, a requirement. And that came about, Lisa, because of a student movement, a parent movement, a teacher movement. Whether or not we're teachers or not, we can demand that our school districts teach more inclusive histories. We can demand that if we're living in a district where 65% of the kids are of Dominican descent, that by gosh, there should, should be units about teaching the history of the Dominican Republic, right? right. You don't have to be a PhD to demand that. Uh, there's more space now. And in, in Miami-Dade, my, my brothers and sisters listening, and I know there's some tonight from Miami-Dade, we just had a revolutionary moment just a, a little over a month ago. Miami-Dade has now made it official that African-American and Latino histories will be taught. And there was argument about it. And some people said, well, you know, black history, you know, uh, it might is it communistic, you know, we, we know. But but th those arguments lost. And so it was, again, because of a popular movement of parents, students and teachers. Um, it's happening all over the country. This is so exciting to see demands for more inclusive curricula. As a teacher, I am so excited to see students, even when they walk out of class going on strike, demanding what? the right to study more. Yeah. My gosh. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. And, I mean, I'm happy to also share that because of that demand created by students. And we always have to remember our freedom movements have been propelled by three groups of people, young people, high school aged, working class people like your, your mom, uh, you had told, you wrote a wonderful blog post. Your mom had a sixth grade education, right? Yeah. My father had a seventh grade education, right? He, he, he was one more year advanced than your mother, but though it was the working class people that created the farm worker movement. It was the working class people that created the new immigrant rights movement of today. Mm -hmm. And then the third group of people are the people that are kind of watching the show right now. You know, they're people who are, you know, we're kind of in these uncomfortable spaces. So, you know, you're a noted author now, I'm a professor. Uh, we have, I know you have imposter syndrome, I have it too. I, I sometimes wake up and say, what am I doing? A university professor, my gosh. But there's roles for all three of those groups, really young people, working class people, and people like us to get involved. The yeah. spaces are there more than ever. And I, the last thing I'll share with you, I was talking to a school superintendent. Uh, I won't call her name. Uh, she is a superintendent of a school district that serves about 200,000 students mm -hmm. in public schools. And she was telling me uh, she had read African American and Latinx histories uh, in the United States. And I just shared with her that Beacon Press, my wonderful publisher, is actually in the process of, of creating a young adult version of an African American Latinx history in the United States, which will be geared towards middle school and younger high school students. And she said, you know, Paul, I'm beginning, you know, she's, she goes, I wouldn't have said this 10 years ago, but you know what? I think the United States needs a revolution. Hmm. What do you think? Do. And I, I was like, okay, wait for it, wait for it. And I said, well, ma'am, I think you may be right. <laughs> you know, but I, <laughs> I mean, a mainstream superintendent who's saying this, you know, we need a revolution, and that's exactly yeah. what this country needs. And so we're we're waking up everywhere. Um, uh, it's so exciting to see, you know, the work that you have done, uh, your magnificent uh, appearance uh, and statements on the Oprah Winfrey Show. Uh, which said, you know, again, you said with with your mind what so many of us have been thinking, you know, but afraid to say. Um, we need to start representing ourselves. We need to teach young people. Now I'm going to sound like the conservative teacher, right? <laughs> teach our children how to write, how to speak, how to represent themselves. Writing is to the 21st century what public speaking was to the 20th yeah. century, right? Because you have Twitter, you have all these these uh, uh, um, platforms that require us to write, yeah, write concisely. So I'm just you're you're the perfect role model for mm -hmm. where we can go, you know, in the 21st century. Thank you. I really appreciate that. And I appreciate your time, um, everyone tuning in. Thank you so much. Um, and uh, I am I, I was I was thinking recently that we need to. Um, we need to change our thinking around like self promotion and like what that means. But I'm not afraid to tell you that if you want to support my work, uh, you can pick up my book, my underground American dream. Uh, it's also in the same link where you can find Dr. Ortiz's book 
and African American and Latinx history of the United States. Uh, Dr. Ortiz, thank you so much. I mean, I could keep talking to you for many more hours, but I, I just, I'm so thankful that you took the time to, to join us. I am so, so grateful to every single person that, uh, and, 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 uh, by the way, Dr. Ortiz, my, my goal is that this will not be the only four conversations that we have. I am hoping that we have a second season of this series and I hope that you will, that you will be back. I would love to be back and thank you again for the honor. Uh, uh, it's, it's really an amazing experience. Um, I'm excited, I'll be tuning in. Uh, so I encourage everyone here, you know, Laura and uh, other people on the series are just gonna be amazing people, so thank you. Thank you so much. So yes, we, we hope to see you next week for the second episode of La Historia Uncovered. Again, if you're posting, and I hope that you do, I hope that you help us to spread the word. This is as much, uh, something as that I created, but I, I, it's something that we're all creating together. And so I hope that you help us to get the word out. Um, please post about this episode. Use the hashtag La Historia Uncovered. Um, next week, we'll be speaking with Ed Morales, who is the author of Fantasy Island, Colonialism, Exploitation, and the Betrayal of Puerto Rico. We'll be discussing the colonial history of Puerto Rico, why Puerto Ricans have what he calls a second-class citizenship status, and how Hurricane Maria exposed everything that has been bubbling up in Puerto Rico for a long time, for centuries, really. I want to just say a huge thing Thank you again to our partners. We all grow Latino Rebels, She Se Puede, and Bise. And thank you so much. And I hope to see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>